Father, we thank you and we praise you. Lord, lead us and guide us into your word. Bring understanding to your word. Be the one that fulfill our heart's desire and our heart yearning for your presence. Holy Spirit, we thank you for being here to lead us. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, when the year turned, um, the leadership, our pastor guided us into faith. You know, without faith, it's impossible to please God. For a, few, for a couple of months, we dealt on the area of faith. Faith was supposed to fortify us and give us something to, to hope for. And here, after that, we went to, based on the faith that we uh, learned, it challenged us, God challenged us to dare to do. And uh, a couple of months, we learned on how to dare and to do. Well, then we came to where um, we needed to not just do one time, but to be consistent in what we are doing. Consistency shows the mark of us understanding what we learned and what we plan to do. And here we are, based on what we learned through the year till now, it's time that we start bearing fruits. That's why this month we're studying on fruitfulness. Somebody say fruitfulness. fruitfulness. Hallelujah. Fruitfulness. You know, whenever there is fruitfulness, fruit, fruitfulness, there is also fruitlessness. Fruitlessness. They are opposites. That's a case where you're being fruitful and a case where you're not being fruitful. Today, on the fruitfulness, I just want you to see, please, if you may post it there, the, the disappointments that come with unfulfilled expectations. Somebody say, unfulfilled expectations. Unfulfilled, I'm not hearing you. Unfulfilled expectations. Yes, you know, for anyone, any farmer to go into a field and expect to pluck any fruit, they must have already done some things. You don't make expectations where you have not done or sowed the right atmosphere to actually receive increase. So we're going to go starting this morning looking at the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21. And we're going to read from verse 18 to 22 uh, using the NLT, please, this morning. Now, on this here, Matthew 21, from verse 18, our Lord Jesus, this was our can where he cursed the fig tree. On verse 18, it says, In the morning, as Jesus was returning to Jerusalem, he was hungry, and he noticed a fig tree beside the road. He went over to see if there were any figs, but there were only leaves. Take note of that. There were only leaves. Then he said to it, May you never bear fruit again. And immediately the fig tree withered up. In another account, he said, they went, by the time they came back, they saw that the tree withered, withered. The disciples were amazed when they saw this and asked, how did the fig tree wither so quickly? Then Jesus told them, I'll tell you the truth. If you have faith and don't doubt, you can do things like this and much more. You can even say to this mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea and it will happen. You can pray for anything, and if you have faith, you will receive it. Hallelujah. Uh, let's go uh, another place um, on here, which was um, also in Gospel of Mark, one of the synoptic uh, Gospels. In Mark 11, the same account, but a little shorter. Mark 11:12. To 14, it says, The next morning as they were leaving Bethany, Bethany, Jesus was hungry. He noticed a fig tree in full of leaves a little way off. So he went over to see if he could find any figs. But there were only leaves because it was too early in the season for fruit. Then Jesus said to the tree, May no one ever eat your fruit again. And the disciples heard him say that. Father, again, we thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Jesus, for helping us understand, even as we 
You guide us by your spirit into greater understanding. Now, going into this, the goal of every farmer is that their seed may germinate and bear fruit. No farmer would want to toil all season by tilling the ground, planting the seed, pulling out the weeds, fertilizing the crops, and have nothing to show for it when harvest time comes. There is a certain expectation that after giving it such attention, the effort would yield fruit, maybe even from a bountiful harvest. You remember what I said from the beginning, you don't expect something from what you have, where you have not sowed. And I went through this um, year how we've gone through faith, how we've gone through dare to do. All of those in preparation, and I wasn't there when all this was planned, but I thank God that I'm being part of it. And here we are through consistency, and we are expected now to be a fruit, to be fruitful. Why? Because something has been deposited in all of us. If not from years past, this year, there has been preparation in the way of you knowing and learning, learning and knowing continuously about faith. And then being challenged, daring to do, and doing consistently, doing consistently. The mark of that consistency and obedience in us coming, being expectant that there be fruit. There be fruit from me, from you, from every one of us. And as you can see, God having made it possible for us to have this place. Look at it. As God will say to the children of Israel, it's not because of your number, it's not because of your size. That you don't say it's because of our size that we're able to do all this. No. It's because of his grace and because of you being obedient. So you can clap for yourself. Yeah. Because it's not easy to be obedient. Grace is always provided for anything that God challenges you to do. But then the honor is on you, on me, to show through obedience. Now you come to think of it, why was the fig tree cursed? It wasn't because Jesus, yeah, he was hungry. But it wasn't because he was so angry that the fig tree did not give him fruit. Remember, he was one that multiplied a few fish and barley loaves. So Jesus could have said, I command you to bear fruit. But it wasn't about that. But rather it was based on unfulfilled expectation. As Jesus saw the fig tree from afar, Jesus was expecting that when I get here, I'm hungry, there will be a bud of a fruit that I can pluck and then eat and satisfy that hunger. And as we think about this, you know, in Mark's gospel, it talks about it wasn't yet season. It wasn't yet season. But you know, Jesus did not say it wasn't yet season. It was something the writer put in there. So when you are expected to do something, especially from up above the Lord who is God, who fills us, and he's expecting when you say, I'm not ready yet, it's like someone making an excuse for the fig tree that it wasn't the season yet. God is one who prepares us. He's one who's tilling the ground. He's one who makes us ready. We cannot be ready by ourselves. That's why I keep saying when people pray for grace, it's okay to pray for grace for somebody else. But anything that God is giving you to do, know for a certainty God has provided the grace. God will never lead you to a battleground facing enemies and challenges and not provide you the right weapon of warfare. That would not be a just kind of God. But it's okay. To thank God for the grace that he's provided. 
I've learned to continue to thank God for the grace because you know what it tells me is it forms within me that I don't have to rely on God, I didn't have the grace. Lord, I didn't get the grace or it wasn't the right season to provide food. But the funny thing is this. I did a little research about fig tree because I was wondering, just as many of you or some of you may have wondered, why would Jesus expect a tree to provide fruit when it wasn't seasoned. The pattern for fig tree is that, first of all, they bud with a fruit, a little fruit. There comes a time after the fruit, then they have leaves, bold leaves, in preparation for a bigger fruit. So, to ex- Jesus to expect, though it wasn't the season, he expected because though it was not the season, it was the right season for you to bear even the smallest of fruit that is enough to tie me over until when the major pre, uh, uh, fruit is supposed to come around. Do you see that? you always going to do, and he expects you to do, with that which is in your hand. Not when, you're, not when the bucket is full. I can challenge you. If you're not doing the little that you can when you do not have much, don't expect yourself to do more when you have much. You get it? You get it? If you cannot do with the little that you have. But you see, I thank God that in House on the Word, again, you can see, we are doing much by God's grace with the, with, with the little that, it, that are here. Consider this. If we continue to be fruitful, continue to show ex- by example that those who are coming to join us and after us, they will emulate that which we're doing. Nothing will be lacking in his house. And that's how God wants it. Amen? So why was the fig tree curse? Again, I said the natural progression of fig tree is to bear fruit and then have leaves, or both at the same time. But here, this one did not have any fruit. Have you ever set expectation and then faced with disappointment when that was not there? You heard in Proverbs 25, 14, where it is, like it says, it is like clouds and wind that brings no rain. And Proverbs 13, 12, it talks about hope deferred. Thank you, Pastor. You mentioned that yesterday in our prayer time. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a dream fulfilled is like a tree of life. Fruitfulness is about life. It is. God has healthy expectations of us as Christians after the way he demonstrated his love for us. Remember, In John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved that he gave us his only begotten son, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God did not wait for us to say we are ready to send his son. Again, I'm talking about fruitfulness. For God so loved. So, God invests in us and continually does so in very many ways. And as you know, he continues to do this because of his love. And he promises us that nothing, nothing shall separate us from his love that is in Christ Jesus. What are the fruit that God expects of every Christian? Uh, Please help me Galatians 5, 23. These we already know. And these we cannot continue to make excuses about. Because it's all before us. Our God. To put a healthy expectation on us is because he has invested bountifully. Now in Galatians chapter 5, from 22 it says, But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. What are those fruits? Say it after me, please. Love, 
joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Amen? All of these are the one fruit. The one fruit that when we imbibe in the fruit producing business, the Holy Spirit, as we rely on him, will continuously let these things flow, flow through us. Like a ceaseless stream, always bringing about fresh water to the taste. These are the fruit. And all of this starts with love. Love for God and love for humanity. And the only way to, 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 to yield this fruit can only be through our obedience to his Holy Spirit. In the way of righteousness, worship, and all these things, including obedience, will bring glory to our God. But what are the hindrances or the blocks or blockage to us being fruitful or fulfilling expectations of fruitfulness? Now we know that we're faced with lack of faith, though we've been taught faith. Ever since you become a Christian, you've heard about faith. Faith is the substance of faith, hope. We've taught, and this year, our pastors led us this year by again going to the root of it all. Because the root of it all is our faith in Christ Jesus. So we cannot say that we lack faith. Now, you know, we know iron sharpens iron. There are a lot of irons in this place. They are willing to help guide us, the pastors, the deacons, the HODs, the fellow believers, by his grace, can also help us where we're lacking in faith. So we cannot use lack of faith as an excuse anymore because if it is, it's just that excuse that anyone can have that excuse. You know, that's the good thing about excuse. And that's also the bad thing about excuse is that everyone can formulate excuse. We can give excuse. This week, it was very this past was a very challenging week. It really was. It was so challenging that I was, I was having wars within my members. And uh, as I shared with my brother is that for me to come here by his grace and stand before you and speak, there are certain things, preparations that I have to make. I have to always ask myself certain questions. Am I a worthy vessel. By myself, my own determination, I'm not a worthy vessel. And when I was having this war amongst my members, and it was all up here, it hadn't gotten to this place because I know this place, that's where my God captured me. And then I made a call. I actually sent a text and said, I'm not sure I'm ready. I'm not sure I'm ready to face my brethren. I'm not sure to face people here, people that are over there by the airwaves hearing me speak because I'm not worthy. But then things started turning as I prayed and all. And somebody said, you know, you are not ready. You may not feel you're worthy, but I'm the one that makes you ready. I'm the one that prepares you for readiness. The state of readiness is not something that you, as the Spirit of God spoke to me, is not something that you can say, I'm ready. Not when it comes to the Word of God and His children. So God spoke to me, telling me that He's the one who makes me ready. I said, okay. I've already sent out that 
I'm not going to, I don't think I can. Then he gave me the grace to really send another text and say, you know what, I'm preparing anyway. If it is that you cannot or you can't find anyone just, and if God clears that I be the one, so you know I'm getting ready. So you know I'm getting ready. Now, first day I went, second day I went, I didn't hear anything. Only thing I heard is that somebody has already been substituted for me. Then I started thinking, God, you're not going to set me aside, but it's not about me. But I don't want you to set me aside. Because I started thinking, like, like I'm going to bribe God if you do this then I'm going to be in the right frame of mind. Do you know how it is? You, it's like you want to make a deal with God. If you do this for me, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and do this. God says, by the result, I'm not going to do it. At least that's what he said. I said, okay, thank you. Whether you do it or you don't do it, you are God. I am just your servant. Grant me the strength in the inner man. Help me to walk in the grace that I know. If you want me to do this, I'll be able to do it. So I sent out another text. Actually, this time, not a t- I sent a text. Then I called. I said, and then I received it. Don't worry. It's already taken care of. I've already sent the contest and all that. I'm like, I'm going to try again. Then I, I now picked up the phone and then I said, you know, and we had a heart-to-heart talk. The heart-to-heart talk was such that it's not about me, it's not about you, it's not about you, it's not about you, it's about God. But if you are comfortable in your decision, I'm ready to go with it. I left it alone. God went and I'm whipping this person. And then next thing I knew, I got a call. I said, I'm, thank God that you called. I'm glad you called. Let's now talk. We talked like brothers. That's what we do. We came to an understanding of what God wants to do. And they, both of us said, it's not about me. It's about God. May God use the instrument that he provided. The question becomes, are you waiting to say I'm not worthy? Is that why you're not being fruitful? There's a lot of work that needs to be done in his house. If you continue to mark time for God to say you're ready, we wouldn't have any choir. We wouldn't have any ushers. We wouldn't have anyone in the technical department. We wouldn't have any teachers. And we expect to come and be fed. Who's going to cook the meal? Who's going to prepare? Who's going to cut the tomato? Who's going to chop the onion? You know how you make the food. You know how you prepare it. But somebody does prepare it. There's a lot of work to be done. Fruitfulness in your house, in your home. Are you being fruitful? Have you taken a humble approach to see that maybe the way you're talking to your spouse is not yielding the kind of expectations that God or even you look within yourself? What about your children? Don't learn the hard way. Don't learn the hard way as to how to treat your children to bring them closer. I am learning. I'm learning each and every day. You see with your children, they are not all the same. You have to invest time to see. It's all about preparation, yieldedness, surrender, submission, and then obedience. If, you don't, if, if you're not ready for, to, 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 to walk the walk, you're just doing the talk. And people know only when you do the talk. And you're not walking the walk. In house on the word, we want to raise people who are ready for transformed lives. And it takes me, it takes you, it takes all of us because we're in this together. 
No one of us, none of us should miss heaven. And it's not just about making heaven. It's about making heaven in a very glorious way with rewards, bountiful rewards because of the fruit. And our chance of bearing fruit is only here. What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Lack of love is because you don't love God. I know you do. It's because you don't love your brethren. You better learn to because you're going to be with them in heaven. The love is what would help you, strengthen you to call someone and say, you know, let's get on the same page. Let's have understanding. Let's work together because we have work to do as a team. See, in the team, there was, there was a father, the, the son, and the Holy Spirit. They worked as a team. They still work as a team. What makes us think that we cannot work as a team? And now, in House and the World, I'm, I, 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 I'm happy to see even the young people coming up, teaching us, letting us see that things need to change somewhat. And now, for, for, for old folks like, like Pastor Steve and Pastor She, it's kind of hard to get them to turn. They're like behemoth. They're, they don't talk, turn easily. You know, Pastor She is very old and Pastor Steve very old. I'm one of the younger ones. All right? So, so I'm with you younger people. Pastor C, I'm with, we are together. We'll continue, you know, brother, 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 you know, brother William. I'm with you. I'm with you. All of you. All of you. We, we're going to get this ship turning to the right way because we have to bequeath something to you and you have to be ready. We have to prepare you. Jeremiah, Ashton, David, these young people, this is for you. This is for you. It's about God. It's about God. Amen? So let's stop making excuses. They are necessary. No time. My job. No job. My spouse. No spouse. You know, my children. No children. Fear of the unknown, feelings of the inadequacy, all of these things, you know, we can find them everywhere, at every nooks and cranny of our lives. It's time that we discard these excuses and start bearing fruit, and it's fruit that will remain. And I can assure you, fruit of righteousness will always remain because, because they must remain that we receive the reward. We have to have faith in God and believe his, his love for us. We must trust his spirit to remain connected, for us to remain connected. And Jesus, as you're going to hear, being taught and being preached from John chapter 15, from 1 to 15, he is the grapevine. Do you know what a grapevine is? Grapevine is an avenue of the message Grapevine. Have you heard it or I heard it through the what? Grapevine. But the thing when you hear something through the grapevine, there's something special about that. When you hear something through the grapevine, it is, it is an unusual, unusual format of getting a message, which means it's directed for some, certain people. Grapevine is not something that is just heard by everyone. While people are tuning into CNN, tuning into CBS and all that, you heard it through Grapevine. Jesus, when he came, was sent for some people. That's why he was the Grapevine. He was the Grapevine. See, he was called, he was called into this world for people like you and me. That's why not everyone here that hears the message turns to the message or listens to the message. You are special. God counts you as special. And you know why? Let me tell you this. You can have anyone read the word of God, read about Jesus' death and resurrection, read about Jesus' coming, and they will not get it. If they understand it is only here, it doesn't touch here. But you know, when the Spirit of God prepares you, marks you out for salvation, oh Jesus, all you have to hear is the word Jesus. And the word Jesus is translated in granular forms to where it begins to make meaning in your life to say, oh, 
I am special because God considers me special that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for my sin. Other people will say, who don't get it? Why would a father send a son that he loves to die for people who do not deserve it? That's not the message that you get. You say, God loves me so much that he gave his son to die for me. This is my call to salvation. That's why I love him so much. I'm a child of God, and so are you. I am special because God put a special mark on me, and so has he on you. Well then, what are we waiting for? I don't need to come beg and applaud you to come and do what you are already equipped to do. Join us. Let's join hands and get this work going. Amen? Amen? Amen. The father is the gardener. You know what a gardener does? A gardener doesn't just do all of that because of selfish interest in the way of what he's going to gain. A gardener will go and plant a few things in the yard, like be it flowers. You can't eat flowers, but you love the beauty of the flower. God is looking at you, admiring the beauty of you, exemplifying Christ in you. That's what he's doing. But you know how disappointed it will be if he comes over and over. You or I, we continue to make excuses. There is no fruit for him to pluck. My brothers and sisters, I'm going to share with you some things that a gardener does and then I'll be done. The gardener nurtures and nourishes the garden with his love. He cuts off every unproductive branch since God does not waste the resources. God prunes the productive branch, which is you, by removing all the dead as well as branches that are unproductive, that are parasitic ones, so that the good branch may continue to bear more fruit. And he accomplishes this through his word. Now you wonder why the word but hurts, as he will hurt some people this morning as I speak it, by his grace. But he's going to comfort some people and he will ginger some people to do, to do work in his kingdom. Every single time, the word cuts both ways. Now, the good branch must remain attached to the vine. That's the main trunk, and that's Jesus Christ. That he may remain fruitful. This is the only way to receive nourishment is when you are fully secured. If you are not a continuously nourishing or nourished with the word, you cannot expect to be fruitful or be used by the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit takes that which is planted in you to get you to do what he desires of you to do. So apart from Christ, we can do nothing. He's only a Christian. He's, he's only a Christian. If someone comes and they say they are Christians without Christ, and that's an oxymoron, as you know, a contradiction in terms. He cannot be a Christian. It cannot be, you know, it, there's no Christianity with Christ. There are great benefits to remain in Christ, nourishing and bearing fruit. That's a benefit. And we bear the fruit, and God the Father delights in, the, in answering our prayers, as it says in John chapter 15. Fruit bearing is always evidence that we are his disciples. There's joy that comes from answered prayers and fulfilled expectations. God wants to see his expectations in us, in you, in me, fulfilled. There's joy that comes from answered prayers and fulfilled expectations. We are his friends and we remain friendly with him by obeying his commandments and his love. In conclusion, the unproductive fig tree symbolized Israel's spiritual bear, uh, barrenness as they had fallen short of God's expectations and faced impending judgment despite divine favor and their impressive outward appearance of their religion. Today, where do you stand in your Christian walk? Are you like the fig tree that made excuses and was cursed? That shall not be your portion. Amen? There's now a lot of work to be done and we should get with it to avoid disaster. 
There's a call to service as the harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. Now join me, brethren, and the, and the house of God in praying that God will recruit more laborers in his vineyard. Father, in the name of Jesus, we are grateful. We know you're the one that prepares us for fruitfulness. We heard your word, oh God, we ask, oh Father, help us to take the leap of faith. Whatever it is that we made as excuses, please, Father, forgive us. Forgive us. We repent. We're ready to turn a new leaf that we not be like uh, that fig tree that Jesus cursed. Because we know you are, you desire to bless us and not to curse us. So we thank you. Help us and the word family. Help us reach out. Help us continuously imbibe your spirit. Every step of, every step of the way. And let the name of Jesus continuously be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I hope I didn't do too much uh, beating up on you. Because I'm beating myself up too. We all just need to join hands and God will help us. Amen. Hallelujah. We give God the praise.